Good morning. Welcome to Community Baptist. Good to see you here. It's good to see some of you back. And uh, glad the Lord, the Lord's been really good to us as a church. Um, I know we've had a number of people that have been out and sick. And, uh, but, but everybody's gotten through it. Praise the Lord for that. I mean, everybody's kind of recovering and working through it. So, uh, you know, we just have to say, boy, the Lord is good. And uh, he takes care of us. We're certainly thankful for that. We're going to start off this morning by singing hymn number 656. Send the light, hymn number 656. Let's go ahead and stand this morning as we sing. There's a call comes ringing all the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore, send the light. take time to greet everyone if you're not comfortable shaking it's not a problem uh, but we'll give some time just to walk around and greet people this morning brother Dave will you lead us in prayer Amen. Let's greet the folks around us.
let's uh let's go ahead and do another song this morning turn to hymn number 341 saved saved hymn number 341 I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lived me and what his grace can be for you. By his power divine, sing to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete. For I'm sing, sing, sing. He saves me from every sin and harm. Secures my soul. Nothing better than to be in church on a Sunday and sing about what the Lord's done for you and how He saved your soul. And uh, I trust that brings a thrill to you every time you think about it. We're going to go over just a few uh, announcements just to uh, catch everybody up here. Of course, uh, next Sunday, Daylight Savings Time ends. So I think we uh, roll the clock back, uh, which is always the one I go, yeah. But versus the other one where I go, oh, I'm somehow cheated. I don't know why, but you know, but that's, that's the, that's the one for me. That's a good one. I like think I get an extra hour in life. I don't really, but you know, that's, but anyway, that's what we're doing next Sunday. Uh, so don't forget to turn your clocks back for that. If you need the November call to glory devotionals, the latest edition of the sword, they're all available back there on the hall table. Uh, we did move and we'll be having our quarterly business meeting uh, we rescheduled that till Wednesday night, the 10th. Uh, so the quarterly report uh, we'll do in the 2022 budget will be discussed, and we'll get a copy of that uh, out there on the table here shortly. Uh, calendar orders, just a reminder, if you want to order calendars, the payments are due by Sunday the 14th. Uh, so don't forget about uh, calendars. They make a great uh, gift for Christmas, great reminder. Uh, for us to visually have uh, in, our, in our homes and in our areas. Uh, the poinsettia orders uh, to decorate the sanctuary, the sign-up sheet uh, with all the information is available and the donation forms are on the hall table back there. Uh, so make sure if you do that, you uh, fill those out. Uh, ladies, don't forget about the ladies meeting for November is going to be moved to the 16th. Was the 9th, we're going to move it to the 16th. So make sure you note the date change there. Um, and then just coming up later in, uh, thank, uh, later in November here, we're going to move our uh, midweek service to Tuesday night to 23rd and have our, uh, our traditional uh, Thanksgiving dinner and service on the night of the 23rd. 
So mark your calendars uh, for that so you don't miss that time of fellowship. Uh, and that sign-up sheet's available here somewhere, I believe. And then also Christmas decorating. Mark your calendars if you can help us out with that. Uh, that'll happen on Wednesday the 24th and then Saturday the 27th, uh, 10 o'clock both days. And there'll be a sign-up sheet coming soon for that as well. So please uh, make sure you mark those things down. And I know there'll be a blessing to you. It's hard to imagine we're to that point in the year, but we are to that point in the year. So, uh, so appreciate you uh, helping out and being there for that. Well, let's do one more hymn this morning. Turn to hymn number 236. Nearer my God to thee, hymn number 236. So we're going to go ahead and stand. We'll sing through the hymn and when we get done, uh, we'll dismiss the kids for junior church then after we're done. So let's go ahead and stand as we sing. Again, be seated. I'm going to mention just two prayer requests if you would pray about. Uh, we had a one call this morning. If you pray for Virginia Spencer, uh, she went in for uh, some issues she was having health related, but they've uh, really kind of deteriorated. And uh, if you would pray for her and uh, hold her up in prayer, Brother David, giving us that request. And then also, if you will pray for the Blues, they're uh, going to be here next Sunday with us. And are, uh, they think, potentially found a place to live. Uh, but you continue to pray about that. <laughs> Until we get them here, we get them moved in. 
And if you find anything, again, as a rental, uh, four bedroom kind of set up, please, uh, please let us know. Uh, it looks like they, they have one that potentially may work out, but we're not going to assume that for now. And uh, we'll just continue to pray and continue to look for uh, other situations. But we're, we're excited to have them here. Uh, not as excited as he is to get here. So uh, he, he's, uh, he's really dying not being here. But, uh, but we'll get him here. Uh, certainly will be with us next Sunday. Uh, we're just hoping that we uh, figure out some uh, housing at some point here with that uh, trip as he comes in. So keep those things in prayer. But until that point, uh, Brother Strawn's with us this morning. Brother Ballou, uh knows him from their home church. He's spoken at their church out in Indiana a number of times and uh, suggested that we try and reach out to him and see if he was available, and he was. So we're thankful he's here this morning. Brother Strong, come on up and preach for us. I think I have that turned on right. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Now, I'm not used to church building where I've... Usually it's like they're right here. So I have to kind of keep looking around some. have been in some larger church buildings before. It's great to be here. As the brother said, uh, a couple weeks ago, past, your new pastor called me. And, of course, I've been out to uh, Crossroads Baptist Church in Shipshawana, Indiana, I don't know, five, six times now, maybe over the years. And, and so it's really a blessing to be out there. And... Uh, so he just called and said, you know, well, of course, he had just been, you all had just voted him in as a new pastor. And so um, would I be willing to fill in up here? And, of course, I was certainly glad to take that offer up. And so had a good trip up um, yesterday. It rained, but, you know, it's been raining quite a bit lately. But thank the Lord's safety. Uh, and did want to say a few things about my ministry and then want to tell you a little bit about my family before we get into the message this morning. So I, for the last uh, 12 years or so, I have been in a full-time itinerant preaching ministry, preaching at churches uh, where the Lord gives me an opportunity, such as the church out in Shipshawana, Indiana, and a number of others over the years. And prior to that, I was at full-time at a Bible college down in Maryland, and so I appreciated that opportunity, and I was in Christian schools before that. And so um, I, we live now um, near Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, or near Interstate 81 there, I'm, my wife is from Huntington County, Pennsylvania. I'm actually from Florida originally and lived in Florida until I went into the Navy. And while I was in the Navy, my last duty station was in Delaware and met my wife there at, at an independent Baptist church. That's a great place to meet someone, right? You're, al you're already on the same page. You know, you're already on the same page in the same, same church. You know, that's a, that's a great place to meet someone. And so met my dear wife there. We've been married 43 years. And uh, after I got out of the Navy, we moved to Florida, which was new for her. It wasn't, of course, I was going back to where I was at. And then we eventually moved up to Delaware at a Christian school there and then to the Bible College in Maryland. And then now to uh, where we live near Shippensburg. So we've been going steadily north, okay? Uh, and I've noticed it's getting colder, all right? <laughs> I suspect if I was here, it would even be colder still. But uh, I can remember having a meeting in January at near uh, Franklin, PA, Oil City, that area, and it was January, <laughs> okay? In fact, they ended up, I was originally supposed to, I was, I was there, thank the Lord, I got up there, it started snowing, and I was actually coming up uh, 453, part of the way, and it started snowing. You know, it wasn't snowing down my way. I said, oh my, <laughs> you know, can't see the road, that's always a bad sign, right? <laughs> Thank the Lord, though, that uh, I got up there safe. I was so glad to pull into that church parking lot. So relieved. And uh, we, they had a pretty good service this uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Of course, they were pretty used to it, as you folks are too, I'm sure. But uh, so I've, I've had my share of snow over the years. Not growing up in Florida, but uh, since then. But I did want to say a few other things about my family. So uh, we've been, as I said, we've been married 43 years. And uh, we have two grown daughters, our, our, our older daughter, is a single lady missionary in Japan. She's been there 17 years now. And uh, near, she's been in several parts of Japan. Been in northern Japan, been in southern Japan. Now she's in the middle near Tokyo, Yokohama, which is a, another huge city. It's, it's, you know, it's a vast area. And she's been there a couple of years. Her ministry, of course, is the ladies and children. She's actually in an all Japanese church now. 
She's the only non-Japanese. Naturally, she speaks Japanese, but, uh, and writes it and texts it and all that, and emails it and so forth. But uh, so uh, she's there, and she actually has, she likes to come home every two years for about a month. And normally, she'd be home this fall, but the problem is she can get home, but because of the whole COVID thing, she doesn't think she can get back in Japan. I know that other missionaries have that. We had a guy on as a deputation director for a large mission agency down who's at our church. He was saying, yes, a lot of missionaries have had that problem. They can get home, but then they can't get back. And so she doesn't want to leave until she thinks she can, she can get back into Japan. And so right now, uh, it's slowly opening up. Uh, they've been a little slow on their vaccination rates, so they've been really poking along on things. And so they tend to be very methodical on stuff. And so, But anyhow, so Lord willing, maybe in the spring we'll see her. We certainly want to do that. And our younger daughter is at home with us still, of course, being faithful, serving the Lord. But at the moment, she's actually on a six-week mission trip to Zambia, Africa. So right now we have one daughter in Japan and one daughter in Zambia. And so I, we don't know where that'll lead. I think at this point she just wanted to do it. She's, the, the lady she's staying with there is working out of a school there and uh, Independent Baptist Church there. And... Uh, so, um, she, but she's been wanting to go over there for a couple years. And uh, so she's coming back on the 8th of November. And so we're certainly praying for safety for her. The way she's coming back is she's flying. But she flew out from, here, from Dulles Airport to Dubai, all right, and from, that's the United Arab Emirates, and from there to Zambia. And that's how she's going to fly back. So uh, she hadn't had any problem flying over. I was thankful for that. For a while, she couldn't even go there because the airline wasn't flying because of the whole COVID thing. So just praying that she'll have safety coming back. So uh, I do have, and I, I do have a um, ministry, I have a blog, uh, a website. Uh, I, it's called earnestlycontendingbaptist.wordpress.com. It's on my prayer card. I didn't bring very many with me. So, but I do have a couple with me. So if you would like to, uh, to see the website, I've got about 180 articles on there. And I've written, I try to reflect my preaching and teaching in my articles. I haven't written much lately, but I do have about 180 or so articles on there. So if you would like to more information about that website, I'd certainly be glad to give it to you. And so if you would uh, turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. I'm just going to read the one verse, then we'll have a word of prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. We read there, Paul here, as he writes to the church of Corinth, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, we can be here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this church and being a lighthouse in this community. We just pray you'll help Pastor Ballou as he takes over as a new pastor, Lord, and just help the folks here and help him also, Lord, with his move and be able to find housing and just work that all out. Now, Father, I pray about this message here. I just pray that everything said will be done for your glory and honor. I pray, Lord, that it'll be a help to each one here. If there's someone here that's lost, that perhaps even today they'll recognize their lost condition and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And for the majority here that are likely born again, I pray, Lord, this message will be a challenge and a help to them. And, Lord, just meet whatever the spiritual needs are. In Jesus' name, amen. The message this morning is entitled, Taking Personal Responsibility, or Personal Responsibility. You know, one of the prevalent aspects of our modern humanistic society is an unwillingness to accept personal responsibility. That's probably not a shocker to very many here, okay? Uh, you see it all the time. If you're working in a job, if you pay attention to all of what's happening in our culture, you see that. You know, we, 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 you know people do not want to accept personal responsibility. It's a, it's a humanistic thing, though. It's an unbiblical principle, and we're going to see in the Word of God that to be the case. Well, let me just give you, by way of introduction here, before we get into the Word of God, just some uh, examples of this. So let's take the mass shootings we've had over the years, right? Which really aren't very many, okay, by comparison. Obviously, I'm very pro-Second Amendment, okay? But, uh, you know, what does the mainstream media want to do when every time one of these things happen? They want to blame the gun, not the shooter, right? 
But I'll tell you something, you can go to any prison in America and you're not going to find a gun locked up. <laughs> yeah, that gun there, that was the really bad one. <laughs> we had to lock that one up, you know, we got that thing locked away, it's not going to do anything else. No, because you know what, it's not, the gun's just, a, a, just an instrument, it's just, a, it's just a, a tool, that's all it is. It's just like, it'd be like blaming the car for the hit and run accident, right? Yeah, we've got to impound that car, let me know that car out again. No. So what, what, what do we need to do there is they need to take personal responsibility. Or here's another example. Many years ago I read this, and I guess it's true. In, anymore you have to wonder about some of these things, but you know what, it's, it's crazy things like this. But a man uh, hit, a, hit a utility pole while he was driving. So he tried to sue the utility, uh, electric company or the telephone company. You know, that pole just sort of just jumped out at me, right? But you know, I, I can believe that. You know, I can believe that would happen. So what's he trying to do? He's, trying, he's not taking personal responsibility. Um, you know, we're all to blame. You ever heard that? Ever been at a meeting or ever been at something where someone said, we're all to blame? You know, I don't know about you all, but when I hear that, we're all to blame, I think, well, really, nobody's to blame. <laughs> it kind of just dilutes it, doesn't it, right? Because if we say we're all to blame, hey, we're everybody's to blame. Oh, okay. Well, we'll agree to that, right? But you know what? Me personally, I guess I don't really have too much responsibility then. Or here's even wor a worse one. Society's to blame. You ever met society? <laughs> there is no Mr. Society, okay? There's individuals that make up a society. There's individuals that make up a family. There's individuals that make up a local church. There's individuals that make up towns and states and so forth. And really the principle is this, that most people feel little personal responsibility when there's a collective guilt. When you have a collective guilt, when you say, well, everybody's to blame, or it's the society's fault, then it takes, what that does, it takes personal responsibility away. When you blame the environment, or you blame COVID, or you blame whatever, right, you know, it takes away from personal responsibility. But well, that's what our humanistic culture has been doing for a long time. But as always, we need to look at what God's Word teaches. That's what we need to look at. What's the Word of God say? A clear biblical principle is that we are personally responsible for our actions. But you know, this idea of blaming others, other people, blaming the culture, blaming the environment, blaming whatever, is not new. This goes very back all the way to the book of Genesis. If you want to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We see the very first people, Adam and Eve. And the very first people, Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, committed the very first sins. And shortly after doing so, God confronted them with their sins. And what did they do? Immediately, did they accept personal responsibility? No. See, that's a, that's a characteristic of sin. Uh, Genesis 3.12, Adam was, God confronted, of course, now I understand, God already knew what they had done. God already knew what they would say. But God wanted to give them the opportunity to, you know, accept some responsibility. In Genesis 3.12, here's the man's response to, to God. He says, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. You know, it's interesting. In that statement, Adam just does, doesn't just blame his wife. He actually blames God, too. Because you'll notice, he, he could have just said, the, the, uh, the woman, uh, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. But he didn't just say that. He said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. See, if you give me maybe a different one, <laughs> this thing might have turned out different, right? Right? Well, I guess that's what he's sort of saying, right? If you just give me a different one. See, just, I got the wrong one. No. Um, so what did he not do there? He didn't take personal responsibility. See, that's a, he wanted to blame God. He wanted to blame Eve, his wife. But he didn't want to take him, blame himself. But then when it was Eve's turn in, the next, in verse 13, three, Genesis 3, 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it thou hast done? Again, the Lord knew exactly what they had done. He's got God... Triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are omniscient. It means they know all things. But he want, again, wanting to give them an opportunity to respond. Uh, what has thou done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Now that word beguile means deceive. And that was true. 
the serpent, Satan via the serpent did beguile her. That's right. That's right. You know, but it's interesting if you if we look over in the New Testament, the Second Corinthians eleven three, and of course in the context, this is t Paul's talking to the church there at Corinth about the fact that they've gotten away from some some simple biblical truths and and been deceived and the dangers of that. But in Second Corinthians eleven three, Paul says, "But I fear." lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So again, in the context, he's talking about the simplicity of the gospel. Because you know what? I'm so thankful the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't complicated. Man's a sinner. Man needs a savior. Man can't come to a holy God except through Jesus Christ. It's not complicated. Although... You know, for so many, and this is not the purpose of this message this morning, but for so many, they have so many roadblocks in their life, their own pride, uh, world religions. Uh, you, there's a number of things. I have messages that deal with that. But it is a simple thing. But what Paul is also, he mentions just in passing about the fact that the serpent beguiled Eve. The serpent deceived Eve. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.14 adds some additional light to this. 1 Timothy 2.14 we read, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. In other words, Adam knew what he was doing. He didn't have the excuse of being deceived by the serpent, via Satan deceiving, you know, via the serpent there. So it's interesting that in Eve's case, she really had the better excuse, you know. She could at least say, well, I was deceived by this serpent. Maybe Satan was involved in this. But, but you know what? They both had to accept personal responsibility. It didn't matter what their excuse was. And so, you know, that's the first, so here we have the very first people in the Bible with the very first sins, and the very first thing they do is not want to accept responsibility about that. Nothing's changed, right? Still going on. Still happening today. Happening with lost people, and sadly, it's still happening with us. It's, it's because we're not sinlessly perfect. We'll get to that more later. But here's another example, still in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 32, starting with verse 22. Now, the context here, Exodus 32, starting with verse 22. Here we have uh, involving Moses and Aaron. Moses had gone away to receive the law. He was, he was away for a while. And while he was away, he put Aaron in charge. Now, you know, it's interesting. When you're in charge, this is something that sometimes people that are in charge don't want to do. They, you know, it's interesting. When people are in charge, they like the idea of the, of the benefits of being in charge, right? I, how many, if you were in charge, would like the benefits of being in charge? You know, I'm in charge. I'm the boss, right? I can make the decisions. Yeah, I get the best office or, you know, I get the best this. I get all, that, that's great. But you know what goes with that? Responsibility. <laughs> You're in charge. I was in the Navy for five years, and I understood very much the chain of command, all right? And the way the chain of command worked is that the commanding officer of the base was in charge. So, yeah, they had a lot of benefits and privileges. Or Because I was never actually on a ship, interestingly enough. You can ask me about that later. But, uh, but the point is this. The same, it didn't matter if it was a ship or a, or a base or whatever. You know, if you're in charge, you're also responsible for things. And so when, and you're, you get all the benefits of being in charge, but if things go south, you also get the responsibility of that. So Aaron was in charge, and Aaron failed. And when he was confronted with his failure, we're going to pick up here with Exodus 32, verse 22. Here we see, sadly, Aaron's pathetic defense. It's really almost comical, isn't it, as we read it. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot, talking to about Moses here. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief, for they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what's become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it in the fire, and it came out this calf. You, can, you know, I, I don't even know how this really happened. You know, I just, I just, it just sort of the people were troublemakers, you know, and uh, Moses was gone, and and they wanted these gods made, and this, this sort of all happened. That's, just, that's kind of a paraphrase of it, right? But, you know, it's a sad, it's a sad excuse. You know, a Moses put Aaron in charge. Aaron failed at leadership. But you know what? We see a good principle at work here. Failures of leadership so often affect others. They don't just affect ourselves. 
If we fail as a leader, and whatever that leadership may be, we can see that. And so the result of Aaron's failure of leadership was that the people's idolatry was that God judged that as a result in the form of a plague. In Exodus 32, 35, we read, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. In other words, Aaron's wrong a failure of leadership caused a plague to happen. It didn't just affect him. And so let's bring that to, to today. Leadership, you know, failures affect others. That's true in homes. That's true in churches. That's true in countries. God, and by the way, biblical principles are the same everywhere, you know. Uh, whether, so here's a good example right here. So when, when leadership fails, it affects many others. So, you know, we can laugh. Go back, going back to Aaron here, we, we, can, we can laugh at uh, Aaron's excuse. It is, it is kind of comical, isn't it, right? But, but we need to understand something. That as believers, we try to justify our own sins at times. We do. Why? You say, wh why do we do that? Well, because we have an old nature. We, thank the Lord, as a, as a child of God, I have a new nature in Christ. If you're born again, you have a new nature in Christ. That's a great blessing, isn't it? We're sons of God. We're born again children of God. If you're saved, you're a born again child of God. We're adopted into God's family. All those wonderful benefits. We know heaven's going to be our home. That's praise the Lord for that. But meanwhile, on this earth, we do have an old nature that we do battle. And by the way, if you're not battling your old nature, something's wrong there, okay? Because either you're sinlessly perfect, which is not biblical, or you're not saved, okay? And we'll look at some scriptures that deal with that later. But the fact is, we do have an old nature. And you know what that old nature tries to always do? Rationalize wrongdoings. Just like lost people do, our old nature wants to do that too. Just like Adam and Eve did, just like, just like Aaron did, just like so many others, you know, rationalize wrongdoings. You know what rationalizing is? We make excuses for doing something wrong we shouldn't do. We try to, we try to justify it in some way. Now, why, again, the old nature wanting to do that. I have a couple of scriptures I want to go here about that. Proverbs 19.21. Proverbs 19.21 says, there are, there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Now, that first part of that verse, there are many devices in a man's heart. See, the heart of man is very complex. I used to teach theology at the, at the Bible College, Maryland Baptist Bible College, and talking about this, the word heart is actually a very interesting, both Old and New Testament. It's actually used interchangeably with some, with some other uh, words, and it's really uh, dealing with part of the core of man's immaterial nature. And you know what? We don't, we don't fully know our own hearts. You know, our culture says, well, well, learn your own heart. You know, do what you think is right. You know, that's, a, that's what you hear that said. Uh, sometimes what we think is right is wrong, okay? Jeremiah 17, 9, great verse. Some of you probably have it memorized. But Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Answer, only God. I don't know fully my own heart. You don't know fully your own heart. Only God knows fully our own heart. And so within us, within, the, uh, within us, the, that old nature is there. And that old nature wants to justify and rationalize. That's why, uh, if, if that wasn't the case, we could just reach a point where we just quit sinning. You know, if we, didn't, if we could just eradicate the old man. But I'm sorry, the Word of God doesn't teach that. Uh, you know, one of the biblical principles I want to bring home, and then it's now is a good time to do it, in dealing with this message about taking personal responsibility is this. The end never justifies the means. We, our culture is so much into that. The idea, well, if it's for a good cause, it doesn't matter what it is, right? I can remember years ago, here's, here's a crazy example, but I remember hearing this. I don't know if I read it or heard it, but I recall it. And that was, there was some kind of, it was a fundraiser. So often it's fundraisers. And it was bartenders raising money for children or something, you know. So they're going to they're gonna sell alcohol, which ruins people's lives and un, unbiblical. But they're doing it for a good cause, see. You know, or, uh, you know, with that way of thinking, we just put a gambling, at, have a, ga a slot machines at church, right? We'll raise money, you know? you know. But you see that over and over again. When it comes to fundraisers, it's amazing what people are willing to do, right? But they justify. So 
you know, the, the world says it was for a good cause, but the end never justifies the means. We have a word called pragmatism. And that actually is, uh, goes back to the ancient Greeks. And it's part of, again, Greek humanism, which so much of our culture, whether people realize it or not, really comes from Greek humanism. And this idea that, you know, whatever works. How often have you heard that? Whatever works. I'm here to tell you that it, if, even if it does work, we may not want to do it if it's unbiblical. In fact, we shouldn't do it if it's unbiblical. So just because it may seem to work, and by the way, so often it doesn't really work. It just works at some level. We shouldn't do something just because we think it's going to work. But you see that over and over again. Whatever works. No. You know, instead, is it, is it biblical? Is it, is it line up with the principles of God's word? Even if, it, even if it would seem to work, if it's unbiblical, we shouldn't do it. So it's never right to do wrong in order to try to do right. Never right to do wrong in order to try to do right. So that, that fits into this whole idea of taking personal responsibility. The Bible clearly teaches us as an we have an individual responsibility, which is why, first of all, every individual needs to understand that they, are, as a lost person, and if there's someone here in that situation that you've never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you're not born again, the first thing before anything else is to recognize you're lost in need of a Savior, that you need to trust Christ as Savior. Before you can go on to do anything else, you can't serve God if you're not, you're not one of His own. You can't, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't uh, do anything to please God if you're, first of all, not part of God's family. Because the Bible, in fact, tells us that if you're lost, you're at enmity with God. You're actually, uh, there, you're at, you're at, there's no peace between you and God. And so first and foremost, that's where, so for the lost person, that's where personal responsibility begins at salvation. But as believers, and that's really what I expect the majority of people here are, maybe everyone is old enough to understand, you know, we need to focus on that for a while. You know, as believers, we're still personally responsible, responsible for those sins we still commit. Now, not because to keep us saved, but, but you know, but, but to keep that close fellowship with God. As, as, a, as a believer, you know, I should desire not to sin and instead, I should desire to keep close sin accounts with God. Uh, James 1.13. You turn there. Verses, James 1.13 and 14. James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Here's an example uh, James cites about someone not wanting to take personal responsibility. He says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil." Neither tempteth he any man. You see, James brings out, this is an example. Someone might say this. Oh, well, I'm being tempted. Maybe I'm being tempted of God. You know, see, a holy God would never tempt us to do evil. Uh, it's against his holy character. You know, by the way, that's something we need to emphasize more, I think, in our independent Baptist churches, is the holiness of God. Because it's such a contrast to the sinfulness of man. Um, but the word tempted here, one of the writers says this, is a solicitation to evil. A solicitation to evil. Now that word tempted actually can be used elsewhere like with Abraham to be a, the idea of a test. But here it is a, just what it sounds like, a solicitation to evil. And so James 1.13, James says here, no, when someone is tempted they shouldn't say, well I'm tempted of God because God would never do that. But now, now, now I want you to notice verse 14. This really brings it down to where so often people are. So maybe they are tempted. Of course they're not tempted of God. But what do they do with, so here's the question, what do they do with that temptation? Where do they let that go? Uh, do, they, do, they, do they resist it like they should? Do they forsake it? Do they flee from it? But by the way, so often people get tempted because they're in the wrong place, <laughs> doing the wrong things. You know? Um, you know, so often we get into trouble because we let ourselves get into trouble. We, 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 we don't put safeguards in our life. We don't put barriers in our life to keep us from being tempted. So, um, but notice here, verse 14, James 1, 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You see, that's where the old nature kicks in. So maybe we're perfectly innocent and weren't expecting it all. So this, you know, it's ambushed, right? Totally out of the blue kind of thing. What do we do with it? Well, it says here, you know... It, if, if we go with it further, and it can become sin, it's because we're drawn away of our own lust. We don't, we don't get out of that situation. Uh, one of the writers says this about the idea of drawn away. 
is that the picture here is, is that of a hunter or a fisherman luring his prey from its safe retreat. Now, uh, some of you that do turkey hunting or deer hunting know something about that. My experience really is so much, it must have been more with fishing as a child. It's when I mainly did a lot of fishing. Of course, it's growing up in South Florida with saltwater fishing, Florida Keys, uh, warm there, okay, and even in the winters. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can remember one time in particular, I was just maybe 11 or 12 years old, and we were out in the Florida Keys, and it's very calm there a lot of times because there's, there's outer reefs, and so it was only four or five feet of water. My dad was actually in the water collecting tropical fish. And he said, there's a big grouper out there, you know, which is a, a nice eating fish. And I, so I'm just in a boat, and so I, you can see the water. Is that clear? I can see the bottom of the water. So I throw my spinning, I put a, a shrimp on a, spin, uh, on a spinning rod, throw it out there, and I actually, actually could see the grouper come out and grab that shrimp. And after he did that, and I had him. And I had him in the boat. Now, I want you to notice something. What did I not do? I didn't take my spinning rod and not put any bait on it. <laughs> so well, I'll just throw it out there, you know, maybe it'll work out, you know. Now, if you know anything about fishing, you know, generally with fishing, you either use bait or lures, okay? You're not going to get much if you just go out there without a hook, just a hook, unless you snag them or something. I guess that's possible, okay? So Satan and this world system have many things of bait and lures, and they have different things for different people. They know what, you know, Satan knows enough about us personally in this, in this world system, the world, the flesh, and the devil, that there are certain things that may affect us that don't affect others, you know? And so we need to recognize that. We don't want to be drawn away. You know, if, if there's, you know, we have, you can have one thing that wouldn't make a, you know, wouldn't make a difference at all with another person. So, so we, the idea that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And so we have to guard against that. We don't want to be like that grouper. And just, oh, nice, nice shrimp, you know. And, and then he, we end up making grouper chowder out of him, I think, you know. If I believe, I, my dad said, yeah, we're going to make grouper chowder out of that. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, in verses 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Galatians 5 and verse 16. Paul here, as he writes to the church of Galatia, churches of Galatia, says this. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You see... What Paul is talking about here, as well as elsewhere, is the struggle that as believers we have. Now, it's true that as we grow in the Lord, as we mature in Christ, we should have less of a struggle. That's right. But don't kid yourself to think there'll never be a struggle. That Oh, I'll just reach a point where I don't sin anymore. Because we'll see here in a little bit here, that's just simply not the case. So Paul is saying, you know, that what can we do? Is this if you walk in the Spirit. Now, the idea of walking in the Spirit is an ongoing Christian lifestyle. Walking so often is this idea of conversations. Sometimes the idea of conversation, talking about our lifestyle. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. It's not like, oh, I just went out and walked on the trail for a few minutes, and then I'm off the trail, and I'm on doing something else. No. Walking in the Spirit should be a day-by-day -day thing for us. You know, every day, here we are, the first day of the week, right? Sunday. You know, it's a new week to begin, and you know, it's right with the Lord's help. Lord, help me this week to walk more in the Spirit with your help. You know, doing the things that will help me walk more in the Spirit. You know, reading the Word of God, praying, uh, and then not doing the things. Because it's both. Brother, I appreciate that Sunday school. You know, uh, we, you got, we got things to do and not to do, right? It's both. It's not just doing things. It's, not, it's things that we shouldn't do. Because you know what? If we try to walk in the Spirit, but we still keep doing the things we shouldn't do, that just, that just hurt, hurt. Hurts us. That just makes it harder to walk in the spirit, because if we don't want, walking in the spirit means we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Those are the choices: walking in the spirit, fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And so, but in order to maintain that close fellowship with God, when we do sin, we need to keep our sins confessed 
Familiar section of scripture, but 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. In verse uh, 8 here, we read, If we say we have no sin, what's John say? We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So the person that says, Oh, I am so spiritual now, I just don't sin anymore. And there's groups like, um, I think, some Christian Missionary Alliance and some, uh, some of the other groups along that line that think you can reach a point where you no longer sin. You know what I think they've done? Uh, obviously, first of all, they have ignored 1 John 1, 8, okay, and other verses, but I think they've kind of made, played a little game here where what they call sins are not sins anymore, but like politicians say, judgment's an error. <laughs> or, uh, you know, accidents or uh, little boo-boos or something, you know, where I don't, that wasn't a sin. That was just, uh, that was just a mistake or something, you know. Never, sound like a politician, right, you know. Instead of what the Bible calls sin, what God says is sin. You know, sin in, in the scriptures is missing the mark of God's holiness and perfection. And so, you know, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. By the way, I have a whole message on deception. We can deceive ourselves. There's a number of verses that warn us about being deceived. Uh, even as believers, because so, John's writing to believers here. You know, you can deceive yourself. Elsewhere it says, let no man deceive himself. Don't be deceived. As we see a number of verses that deal with that. And the truth is not in us. But in the next verse, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm so thankful for that verse. I'm so thankful for the mercy of God. Uh, I certainly need it. I'm so thankful for the grace of God, for the peace of God. And so, you know, the importance of believers keeping short accounts with God. We want to, you know, as we saw back in Galatians, we want to uh, walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But you know what? If, if at times we do get into the flesh, we need to confess it. We need to, we need to uh, repent of it. And so the importance of that. So in closing the message this morning, you know, God created man with a free will. Adam and Eve had a choice. They, they weren't... I'm 100% I'm against all aspects of Calvinism. I'm against any, any aspects, not just the five points, but the whole hyper-sovereignty error, too. If you, I'd be glad to explain that to you. You know, God gave them a choice. God gave them a free will. It wasn't God's will for them to sin. You know, uh, God told them not to sin. He told them what, the thing, one, there was only one thing. Don't, don't do that. Here's what will happen if you do. And so, yet, man did bear a personal responsibility and Adam and Eve, we saw, didn't want to accept it. And today, people still bear a personal responsibility. First, as lost people, to accept Jesus Christ or to reject him. You know, that's, that's, what, that's where it starts first. Again, if there, maybe there's nobody here, but if there's someone here old enough to understand that's not saved, before you can do anything else, uh, you need to deal with that first. You know, the fact that your, your responsibility starts with salvation. You know, it's true that you know, people can be a stumbling block in people's lives, but in the end, they're still personally responsible. For the saved person, though, and that's who this message is mainly directed to, you know, for us, that accountability for what we have done and haven't done for the Lord will ultimately come out at the verse we saw at the beginning of the message, 2 Corinthians 5.10, what we know as the judgment seat of Christ. After the rapture will be that judgment seat of Christ. Let me read the verse again. For we must all, for we must all, doesn't say a few people, some people, we must all appear, all believers that is, before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You see, we're going to have to face the Lord. Now, good, I'm so thankful it's not about salvation at that point. I'm so thankful we'll be in heaven at that point. That being said, though, it is about gain or loss of rewards. It's going to be a sober time. I don't think any of us are going to say, well, I don't have anything, no problem here, you know. I'm, I've done everything I should have done for the Lord. I know I haven't. And I don't think anybody here, if, if you have any, you know, if you're going to be honest, can say you have done everything we should have done. But the fact is, so, so there's where that, for us, 
There's where the ultimate personal responsibility is, is at the judgment seat of Christ. But you know, I want, to, I want to certainly make the point, too, that there's no general judgment like some teach. You know, for the saved person, it will be at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. But for those who die without Christ, all through the ages, where it ultimately is going to be accounted for is at the great white throne judgment. In Revelation 20, starting with verses 11 through 15. I'm going to read there. Revelation chapter 11. So if they die without Christ, they're on their way to an eternal hell. The great white throne judgment is not maybe or so. It's just simply to pronounce the sentence there that they're on their way to the lake of fire. Uh, the Bible teaches an eternal hell, just like it teaches an eternal heaven. You know, Christ dealt, dealt more with, with hell than he did with heaven. And uh, we see in Revelation 20, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, that's of course the Lord Jesus Christ, this judge, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and it was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. Let me just stop there. You know, I have a message on God is no respecter of persons. Here you see in Revelation 20, 12, the dead, small and great is the idea that everybody that's lost is going to be there and they're not going to be. The fact that they were a king or a, 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 a peasant isn't going to matter. You know, the fact that they had a lot of money or they were desperately poor, they were a celebrity or just an everyday person, not going to matter. Uh, the fact is they die without Christ. If you die without Christ, uh, you'll be in... The, you'll be in Hades, the hell, where the rich man of Luke 16 still is, still suffering, by the way, uh, but eventually be at the great white throne judgment to be cast into the eternal lake of fire. And so, verse 13 here, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, hell here referring to Hades, uh, did up the dead which were within them. And they were all judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. If you're saved, your name is written in the book of life. For the lost, though, their name's not written in the book of life. And that's a sad thing. If, they, if, someone, if anyone here is old enough to understand and, and rejects Christ, and you die without Christ, where it all culminates is here in Revelation 20, when you're ultimately cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. By the way, as believers, that ought to burden us for our lost relatives, loved ones, relatives, loved ones, neighbors, co-workers, whoever it may be. So if there's someone here who is lost, I would encourage you to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Acts chapter 20 and verse 21 one of my favorite verses dealing with salvation because it's so clear. Acts 20 and verse 21. Paul here as he writes, the, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, as he uh, is, is talking to the Ephesian elders here, says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. So that's everybody. The, Jew, the Greeks here is the idea of the Gentiles. So the Jews and the Gentiles. Repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance here, what does that mean? Recognizing our lost condition. Taking God's side of our sin. Recognizing we're a sinner in need of a Savior. See, the old man doesn't want to recognize they're a sinner. <laughs> the world says, oh, you're not... Going, is this about personal responsibility? Absolutely. Because the world says, well, you're not responsible. You're just born that way. See, how often do we hear that? I'm here to tell you, nobody's born in the wrong body. All right? There's, there's male and female. I'll throw that in, Okay. There's male and female. That's it. No one's born in the wrong body. Uh, and that's how God made it. And I don't care how many people uh, are confused on that. All right? Uh, and, and people that have sinful lifestyles weren't born that way. Okay? Every sinful lifestyle, whether it be the homosexuals or, or alcohol, whatever it is, that's something they've done on their own. Okay? They weren't born that way. God, you know, that God made them male and female, and God made them with a, ability to choose. And uh, so Paul here though says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So taking God's side of our sin, God's view of our sin, and then putting our faith in Jesus Christ. So that's the message that anyone here is lost. But for those of us that are saved, and again, that's the, really what I've mainly tried to more focus on here. You know, 
The world says, oh, it's somebody else's fault, the environment's fault, COVID's fault, you name it, the UN's fault, I don't know, who, somebody, right, everybody, we're all to blame, whatever. But you know what? God says we're all personally responsible. So as believers, we need to not make excuse for sin. Uh, we need to be desiring to walk in the, in the spirit, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, we, we need to keep close sin accounts uh, conf- as First John talks about, confessing sin. When, when we do sin, when we do sin, and we're going to, we need to confess that sin and then forsake it with the Lord's help. And so that's where I want to close this morning. So let's go ahead and stand. And let's have every uh, person stand, heads, heads uh, bowed, eye, eyes closed. Just give a brief invitation here. Heads bowed, eyes closed. So I wonder, first of all, uh, again, the message this morning has primarily been to those uh, who are saved and those of us that are believers. But let me first say this. If there's someone here who is not born again, you recognize that, you know what, you you have never trusted Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're relying on trying to be a good person, uh, being faithful to church. These are good things. But the fact is, if you're here without Christ, you're on your way to the eternal lake of fire. And so if there's someone here who's not born again, who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I would encourage you even this morning to seek out someone here at the invitation time or after the service about that. For those though that are born again, hopefully the vast majority, if not everyone here, old enough to understand, the message has certainly tried to focus on the fact that, you know, as believers, we need to take personal responsibility. We need to desire to live close to the Lord. We need to, we need to reject the world's humanistic philosophy of, of humanism, of, uh, of pragmatism, whatever works, of making excuses for sin, for trying to justify our sin. Oh, everybody's doing it. Other people are doing it. People in another church are doing it. People in this church are doing it. You know, if it's unbiblical, we shouldn't do it. And so, uh, Lord, Lord, uh, just pray now that there's someone here that's lost, that recognize our lost condition. And Father, for the rest of us, help us, Lord, to desire to take greater personal responsibility, to reject the, the unbiblical thinking of the world. And just pray now during our invitation time now, as the uh, piano begins to play. Just a time of prayer to think about that. Again, if you're without Christ, the urgency of the day is to, is to get that taken care of today before it's eternally too late. But perhaps someone here is born again and recognize, you know, I haven't taken personal responsibility like I should. I've been making excuses for sin. I've been trying to justify wrongdoings. I've been using the world's thinking. And if that's you, now's a great time to get that taken care of and to confess that to the Lord. And with the Lord's help, even this week, to begin to uh, live closer to Him, to uh, be more biblical in your thinking and in your actions. Ultimately, as believers, after, after, after the rapture, we're all going to be at the judgment seat of Christ for what we have and haven't done for the Lord.
Well, it's, uh, but did you want to have a closing word of prayer, or are you going to do it? Whatever, how you want to close it here. All right, well, thank you for that message. Lots to think about this afternoon and to pray on. And uh, be back tonight, 6 o'clock, for our evening service, 5.15 for our men's and ladies' prayer meetings. And uh, we'll see you this evening. Brother Jerry, will you close us out in a word of prayer? Amen. We'll see you this evening.